Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Today, an Earth Focus special. Emmy Award winning environmental filmmakers Hal and Marilyn Wiener on the fragile relationship between people and the world they inhabit. The Wieners produced over 225 documentaries and received over 130 international awards for their work. They are the team behind the PBS television series Journey to Planet Earth. We will look at excerpts from three of the 11 films in this series. On the Brink explores how environmental problems can lead to political crises and increased hostilities. Future Conditional looks at the link between environmental change and the health of our planet as millions of people cope with the spread of toxic pollution. The State of the Planet's Oceans investigates marine challenges like overfishing and pollution, and it examines the most formidable threat to oceans as well as to all life on the planet, climate change. The Wieners share their insights with Earth Focus correspondent Miles Benson on why we face today's environmental challenges and what we can do about them. All coming up on this special Earth Focus. They came here by the tens of thousands. And for over three centuries, Portuguese whalers and cod fishermen did well. To an outsider, New Bedford still looks like a thriving city. But if you take a closer look, it soon becomes clear that it's anything but thriving. The fishermen of New Bedford were simply too good at catching fish. Unfortunately, they too are victims of the collapse of the cod fishery. New Bedford has one of the highest rates of unemployment in the country. Many fishermen are angry and often ask each other in frustrated candor, how could we have ever let the cod disappear? Dave Martins, is looking for answers. I think no one really realized that uh, cod were gonna collapse and stay down for so long. If the water wasn't there hiding all these things that we're doing, a lot of us would really be appalled. Just as we were appalled when we learned about the fact that the buffalo herds were being destroyed, the fact that the flocks of passenger pigeons and waterfowl that darken the skies were no more. It's the same exact mentality. It's just moved away from the land into the sea. What is there in our nature that allows us to go ahead and destroy so much aquatic life and uh, do so much harm to the people who depend on it? Did you ever find an answer to that question? I think it's something that we're still searching for. I mean, we can give some superficial answers. Um, indifference. Um, arrogance. Arrogance. Um, uh, uneducated uh, uh, views of the environment. But I have a feeling it goes a little bit deeper than that. Um, basically, when you look out at the ocean, all you see is the ocean. If you look out on land, it's very easy to see problems. You can see drought, you can see um, pollution, you can see a whole variety of things. When you look at the ocean, all you do is see the beauty of the ocean. And I think people just quite often, they don't get past that um, uh, superficiality so to speak. Maybe it goes back to the old um, religious philosophy that we are dominant over nature rather than part of it. 
And I think that's starting to change. You know, I think we're starting to recognize that we're only a part, a very key part. Unfortunately, we have control over so many other elements on land or on sea, over so many species. But I think we're starting to finally realize that with this control become, comes a certain responsibility. Well, also, you have to remember that for the past eight years, uh, we had a political uh, agenda that said, no, there's no problem. There's no problem. There's no such thing as, as, as climate change. Um, and the ocean is um, capable of taking care of itself. So I think that has a, a lot to do with it also. Marilyn, can you give us an update on the problem, the conditions of the ocean? What are the greatest threats? Where are they coming from? Unfortunately, the oceans are downwind from everything. So there are you know, these huge collective sinks where every bit of pollution on land ends up um, in the ocean. So that uh, puts a lot of species in, in peril. We have a choice. We can either act now um, to do something, or we can wait till it's, it's too late. And I particularly don't want to sit on the sidelines waiting. But there is one known fact that we drive home in our, in our show, and that is that only 10% of the large fish of the world are left in the oceans. That's a staggering statistic. Basically, 90% of the large fish in the world are gone. And what we're now doing, as uh, Carl Safina, a wonderful environmentalist, says, it's like the last buffalo hunt. We're wiping out the last 10%. We're also extracting smaller fish from the ocean as well. And a lot of the, the two billion people or so that defend, depend on this as a protein source are not going after the large fish. Um, they're surviving on sardines and, and smaller fish along the coast of Africa, which unfortunately is being raped by European fishermen, um, not the artisanal fishermen of, of Africa who really need this protein source. Greenland is an island nation, locked in what seems like a never-changing state of deep freeze. However, scientists recently discovered that this polar ecosystem is changing, and at a pace that is sounding alarm bells around the world. Their destination is the Kongerluswak Glacier, At almost five miles across and over 3,000 feet thick, this is one of Greenland's largest ice fields. Though it's almost impossible to see glacial movement with the naked eye, when time-lapse photography compresses eight hours into a few seconds, it becomes more apparent. Once back aboard the ship, the scientists begin calculating the glacier's speed. They discover that it's moving at the rate of nine miles per year, 125 feet per day. Everyone is stunned. The speed of the glacier's march to the sea has tripled in just 10 years. The problem is, Every time glacial ice falls into the sea, it contributes to global sea level rise. If temperatures continue to rise, more and more meltwater lakes will form, and more and more ice will speed its way to the sea. Scientists now estimate that one third of global sea level rise comes from the Greenland ice sheet. If the entire ice sheet should melt, the oceans of the world would rise by a catastrophic 23 feet. Al, is this a war we've already lost? Some people would say yes, I don't think so. Um, I, think it's a, um, I think it's a battle that uh, has yet to be determined. You think we can still reverse the damage that's been done, or at least arrest it? Yeah, I, I think so. I think um, 
We're working on a documentary, a two-hour special right now, uh, called Plan B, and it's basically uh, working with Lester Brown, who's an, you know, an environmentalist futurist. And, and you know, Les um, sees that we can change the course of, 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 of uh, the problems that we're in if we get away from coal-based and uh, oil-based economies. And, and that's really the key. If we put a halt to climate change, uh, global warming in terms of emissions of CO2 into the atmosphere, that's a beginning. It's a, it's a huge beginning. And then if we have an administration that doesn't make the environment a wedge issue, and it's been a wedge issue now for, for eight years, and if we understand that it's not a wedge issue, it is a very real issue, and there is no controversy. There are no two sides to the story. There is serious problems, and they can be dealt with. Uh, in, in the last film that we did, The State of the Planet's Oceans, we point out that uh, the loss of, um, of glacial water in, in the Andes is a, a major um, a national security issue there because as the glaciers of the, war, of the Andes disappear, the rivers that supply irrigation for the uh, farmers in the highlands will disappear. Where will hundreds, if not millions, of people go? They're going to go to cities like Lima, which can barely um, support uh, you know, the 8 million people that surround that uh, city. There's going to be a strain on the Peruvian fisheries, a strain on agriculture, and people are just going to start leaving. Um, the, the same is in, in, um, in Bangladesh, sea level rise. Half of Bangladesh's um, rice um, fields will be underwater. Where are they going to go? They're going to go to uh, India, where they traditionally have gone when things have, are bad. Well, India is not going to be able to support 60 million refugees who won't have rice in Bangladesh. So these issues are national security issues. For us, for Americans, it's if there's unrest in the Middle East, if there's unrest in Asia, if there's unrest in, in South America, it affects us, it affects our borders. So th these are major, major issues, and we try to um, uh, talk about these issues in the last show that we did. It's not unlike the drama unfolding on the Caribbean island nation of Haiti, located 600 miles off the southeast coast of the United States. Thirty years ago, the seaside town of Jacmel was a thriving resort for the rich and famous. Today, its beaches are badly neglected. In the hills not far from Jacmel, workers struggle to save Haiti's deforested and badly eroded slopes. It's not an easy task. Nearly 70% of the country is mountainous, and the soil is hard to hold in place. But even worse, for every tree planted, six are chopped down. Eighty years ago, 60% of the country was covered with trees. Today, less than 2% remain. Satellite imagery of the border with neighboring Dominican Republic shows a dramatic difference in land cover. Uncontrolled logging and the conversion of forests into farmland has contributed to an environmental nightmare. But the use of wood as an energy source in the form of charcoal is the major cause of deforestation. Sold on nearly every street corner, it's easy to use and inexpensive. For the impoverished, there's simply no alternative. And so deforestation goes on, causing additional environmental and economic stress. Deforestation has also affected the lives of the fishermen of Luli. Once, catches of snapper and spiny lobster were abundant and able to support a family. Olivan Valsin has worked these waters all his life. Today, his efforts bring little reward. He'll earn about a dollar for his day's labor. That's why so many of Luli's young people 
have gone to Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince, in search of work. Many end up here, in Cité Soleil, the city's poorest slum. This is where 400,000 people live in the worst conditions imaginable. Sanitation and healthcare are non-existent. Residents are forced to pay exorbitant prices for clean water. Poverty and frustration lead to instability. The streets become a battleground for rival gangs. What are some of the more disturbing things you've seen in putting these things together? We were in, um, in Bangladesh. We were in the capital of Bangladesh um, several years ago. And we scouted a location um, to shoot the next day. And it was a secular holiday. It was a secular New Year. Then we came back the following morning. And there's 100,000 people at this celebration. But we make our way towards this location. And Marilyn suddenly says, no, we're not going there. And I said, well, what do you mean we're not going? Of course we're going there. Marilyn says, well, with my dead body, we are not going there. I just don't feel good about this location. So we set up the cameras, and, and 30 seconds later, we heard the first bomb go off. And then the second bomb goes off. And then we started filming body parts that were coming out. And what happened was that a... Um, a suicide bomber had gone to where the journalists were. And 10 of our colleagues were killed and, and scores were injured. And it really, and we were doing a, a sequence about how environmental pressures can cause terrorist action and cause national security problems. My God, there it was, right in front of us. And w when you see something like that, you see the, 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 uh, the what pressures can bring to uh, a community and to a country, then you say, oh my God. For me, the abject poverty that exists all over the world, uh, the disease that, that plagues children, there are so many things that can be remedied, can, that can be fixed. And it's lacking political will, it, there's a lack of leadership, um, but there are so many problems that are soluble that it's, it's just, to me, it's, it's an incredible injustice that these things do exist. I mean, they're always going to exist to some degree, but when you see one out of five children in Africa dying before age two, in parts of Africa, not all, because of malaria, when there are simple drugs available to save them, it, it, it's shocking, it's, and it should not be allowed to exist in the 21st century. Besides seeing poverty at its worst, and, and, and we've seen poverty uh, uh, 90 miles from our shores in Haiti, which is probably the worst poverty we've ever seen, or in the, in, in the, in the slums of uh, Nairobi, or in um, the worst environmental disaster in the world, the RLC. With it comes this sense that there is a moral, we have a moral duty to do something about this. And in our case, it's, it's telling people what the problems are. But these problems are so unexpected. How bad does it have to get before people become frightened enough to take action? I think it, um, they're, they're, they're probably two thresholds. One is when it affects their pocketbook, and two, when it affects their health. Um, and we're seeing signs of both of those today. I think that things are changing. I think things will change rapidly. The question is whether we can change the problems that we've already created in time. But we may have reached tipping points. Some of the most reputable scientists that we talk to say we have reached those tipping points. But that is such a negative way of looking at things because too often the response to that is, well, there's nothing to do. So why should, why should I do anything? I think the problem is really, really serious. I think when people um, understand that their health is affected, they start to understand that action should be taken. Um, that's a, I think that's a good way to get people mobilized. But it has to be, you know, health, um, besides your own health, it's, a, it's the health 
of the planet. This one seal will feed Barney's extended family for a week. But recent studies show that Inuits have some of the world's highest levels of toxic chemicals in their bodies. It was really shocking when the uh, science started to come in. The food that has nourished us for a millennia, spiritually, emotionally, and physically, were now poisoning us, and it was not of our doing. The discovery of toxic pollutants in the food supply has put 155,000 Inuits on the brink of a public health disaster. The women who eat these animals themselves then are absorbing these industrial pollutants that were originally used in the United States, Mexico, Central America, and China. And as they travel into the bodies of these women, they're deposited in fat. And when they have babies, the fat releases right into the breast milk. They have to feed their babies. They don't have access to formula. And as a result, the breast milk that they are giving their babies a source of life and sustenance is contaminated with some of the worst pollution we have ever seen on this planet. When we talk about the environmental problems besetting this world, we're talking about a very large number of interlinked issues from water, fresh water supplies uh, to the ocean to the global warming problem and the CO2 in the atmosphere, the melting glaciers, the rising sea levels the public uh, throws up its hands. What can we do? What can the individual do about all of this overwhelming avalanche of disaster that seems to be descending on us? I think every individual has to make sure they vote for people that have their interests at heart. They have to go out and organize, do something in their neighborhoods, um, whether it's on a very local level or a national level, I think everybody has to. I think it, we're at that point where we all have to take some responsibility and be very active participants in protecting this planet. This is our only home. Why do you suppose it, it is such a difficult thing for people to understand and accept that the damage is serious and it's accumulating and it's going to get worse? and that it threatens, it really threatens the future of the environment globally. I don't know if it's that difficult for people to accept this anymore. I think what is difficult is to get your hands around the solutions and the, the enormity of the solutions, but I think that people who tend to be aware have, are convinced that this is a problem. The question is, um, what do we do about it, and is it something that all of us have a chance to play a role in. As you moved around the world, uh, did you see anything that encouraged you to be more optimistic, something that you see working that we might copy? There's, in, in, in San Diego, there's a neighborhood called... Uh, uh, Barrio, Barrio Logan. Logan. Yeah. In San Diego, it was a wonderful success story of a community that said, we will not have any more local pollution in our neighborhood from factories that are located there. It took them 10 years, but they won. And actually, they got these places closed. It actually took them 15 years. And what they years. did is they, they had monitors. They, uh, they had monitors showing um, the damage that these local factories were doing to children's lungs, to, to um, there were, the incidence of asthma was staggering in this neighborhood. And as soon as they closed down those factories, the level of pollution um, had gone down so dramatically. And so, you know, it was just a question of, uh, but they, they, had, they had to actually fight to get this done. Uh, I mean, they really, they struggled for 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And, but when they finally, the result was so obvious um, as soon as it was done. Barrio Logan is three miles long and just six blocks wide. This is one of San Diego's poorest Mexican-American communities, and its residents have long been the targets of environmental discrimination. Forty years ago, the city of San Diego tried to force people out of Barrio Logan to make room for commercial development. Zoning laws were changed overnight, 
small factories, junkyards, and auto wreckers were encouraged to move into the residential neighborhood. The community was outraged. It still struggles in its fight for clean air. Each day, hundreds of diesel trucks, nearly 300,000 cars, and dozens of factories operate in and around this residential neighborhood. Studies have been done across the country showing that people of color in low-income communities are much more subject to being uh, the targets of industrial sources moving into those neighborhoods than into other neighborhoods. This has resulted in a variety of health impacts. Approximately 20% of the children in Barrio Logan have either asthma or probable asthma. The failing health of the children sparked a new community protest. This time, they went after Master Plating, a factory located in the residential heart of Barrio Logan that used hexavalent chromium, a known cancer-causing chemical. A few days after Master Plating closed down, the people of Barrio Logan gathered to celebrate the shutting down of a factory that had been poisoning their community for decades. What is the message, the overall message you hope your viewing audience takes away from your documentaries on this? To never throw up your hands and say there's nothing I can do is the message that I would hope that people would have is that um, there is something, but you can't just sit back um, and watch other people take responsibility. Yeah, and, and the, the other message is there is a problem. Marilyn, Hal Wiener, thank you very much. You're thank welcome. you, and thank you for what you're doing. Planet Earth, this is our home. This is where our journey of discovery must begin. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs. Programs which connect you to the world. To learn more, visit linktv.org.